Welcome to MEM 07006 Perform Lathe Operations. Welcome to Pertec Learning and Development. This lecture is a supplement to your student workbook and other resources made available to you. The resource complementing this lecture is the Lathe Manual. This Lathe Manual is available from PMoodle. We recommend that you download and read this resource before continuing with this lecture. Student resources. LibreOffice is a good free alternative to cater for your desktop publishing needs if you don't have access to an existing program like Microsoft Office. If you have a Google account, you have access to Google Docs. You can create documents, spreadsheets, presentations. All you need is an internet connection and you get 15 gigabytes of cloud storage. Don't forget to check PMoodle regularly for updates and resources for your current unit. PMoodle is also available on your favorite mobile device. The recommended textbook for this unit is the Fitting and Machining Trade Textbook. The textbook goes into quite an amount of detail on all the subjects covered in these lectures. The textbook can be purchased online from Hare and Forbes online store or you can visit one of their showrooms. They have a representation in every state in Australia. Take a screenshot now to record the website address for purchasing the fitting and machining trade textbook. There's also a link in PMoodle. The featured YouTube channel for this unit is Cutting Edge Engineering. Great resource and a lot of good practical machining tips. Once again, take a screenshot now or visit PMoodle for the YouTube link. Today we'll be looking at a lot more advanced turning and machining operations, for example, taper turning and screw cutting. All of the PerTech documents referenced in this lecture are available from PConnect. If you don't have access to PConnect, all of the documents are also available from PMoodle. All of the hoses, adapters, hose tails and components described in these lectures are referenced from the Pertec catalogues. Think, plan, do, review. It's the work smart method. Think about what you're doing, plan what you're going to do, do what you're going to do and review what you've done. Main lecture. Today's lecture will be divided up into three sections. Section one, taper turning. Section two, screw cutting on the lathe. Section three, other attachments and operations that can be performed on a center lathe. Section one, taper turning. When we're creating conical surfaces on workpieces. Tapers are often used for mating parts on machinery and sometimes artificial limbs. Tapers provide tight fits and mating parts are easily separated. Pictured here are some machine tool accessories, milling arbors, which utilize collets for location, collets and drill arbors that utilize the Morse taper for location. The Morse taper is commonly used on drill presses, some milling machines, and then the tailstock of lathes. Here we can see the Morse taper is used to mount a drill in the drill spindle. The Morse tapers are thrust into place with a swift movement or a light tap. A drift, which is a tapered tool, is used to release the Morse taper arbor 
from the spindle. Sometimes Morse tapers adapters are used to fit tools with different size Morse tapers. There are eight sizes in the Morse taper range. In this example, a Morse taper is used to mount a drill chuck in the tailstock of the lathe. Ejecting the arbor in this case is done by winding the tailstock handle backwards until an ejector pin makes contact with the back of the arbor and breaks the tapered bond. Common sight around the drill press are Morse taper sleeves, drill drifts and taper shank drills. There are two types of tapers that you'll come across with machine tools. One is the self holding taper. These tapers are usually less than three degrees. These are commonly referred to as slow tapers. Uh, drill chuck arbors, uh, tapers for live centers, dead centers, etc. Another type of taper is the quick releasing taper. This is primarily used for location and quick releasing. These tapers are not self-locking and the angles are usually greater than 18 degrees. They require a locking device like a draw bar on a milling machine. These tapers are commonly used on milling machines, borers and CNC milling machines. How do we describe or express tapers. Let's firstly have a look at metric tapers. Metric tapers can be described as a ratio of millimetres per unit length. For example, one millimetre of taper for every 20 millimetres of length. Or we can express the taper as an angle. As with the metric system, Tapers specified in inches can be expressed in taper per unit length, like thousandths of an inch of taper per inch of length, or inches of taper per foot. As we can see in our Morse taper table, the taper is specified in taper per inch. In this table, the taper is also specified as an angle. Angles can be specified in two ways, decimal angles and angles in minutes, degrees and seconds. Depending on the drawing and information that we're working from, sometimes we have to convert back and forward from these two methods of displaying angles. Decimals to degrees, minutes and seconds. Let's look at this example, 1.43 degrees. Well, the one stays the same, so it's one degrees. Now we multiply the remaining 43 times 60 equals 2,580. So we take the first two numbers, which is 25 minutes. We take the last two numbers, which is 80, and we times that by 60, and we get 48 seconds. So 1.43 degrees equals 1 degree 25 minutes and 48 seconds. Let's convert from degrees, minutes and seconds to decimals. Same as the previous example, the 1 degree stays the same. Now we take the 2548, divide it by 60, that will give us 43 and our answer is 1.43 degrees. Calculators and apps can do the conversions for you. Refer to your calculator instruction manual for details on converting between uh, degrees, minutes and seconds to decimal and back again. Let's look at the methods for creating tapers on the centre lathe. The first method is using form tools. In this example, the form tool is plunged into the workpiece, transferring the shape from the tool directly onto the workpiece. 
This example, the tool, is a 45 degree profile and it creates a 90 degree included angle. It's important to remember on a lathe that what we do on one side of the workpiece is mirrored on the other side. So if we put 45 degree chamfer on one side, a 45 degree chamfer is automatically created on the other side, giving us a total included angle of 90 degrees. Before the widespread use of computer controlled lathes, form tools were a very common method of creating a profile or a shape quickly on the outside of a workpiece. Form tools are easy to use, versatile, but require a very high skill level to manufacture. Form tools are still widely used in the woodworking industry as the machines do not require the massive horsepower that their metal equivalent would require. Creating a taper using the top slide, sometimes referred to as the compound slide. Top slides are versatile for creating internal and external tapers, but are limited to the stroke of the top slide. Therefore, only short tapers can be achieved successfully using this method. In this example, the included angle is 60 degrees, so the top slide is set at 30 degrees. Here we can see a tapered boring operation performed using the top slide. It's important to remember that the top slides are usually manually driven and do not come with a power feed option. Method three, creating a taper using a taper turning attachment. Taper turning attachments have a limited stroke and limited angle capability, but can be used for creating internal and external tapers. Workpieces can be held by chucking and between centers. In this video, we can see that the cross slide is connected to the taper turning attachment using a follower and we can see the taper being created on the end of the workpiece. Taper turning by offsetting the tailstock. In this diagram, the faceplate and driver have been mounted on the spindle. In this example, I've used a soft center in the chuck. I've machined the angle to make sure that it's running true with the spindle. And I placed a drive dog on the end of my shaft and I placed that between centers. It's obvious to see that only external tapers can be machined using this method. The size of the taper is determined by the amount of offset available in the tailstock. By using information of the parts drawing or simple trigonometry, we can work out exactly how far to offset the tailstock to achieve the taper that we need. If we remember, using trigonometry, just by knowing the values of two of the lengths or one angle on the length, we can determine the values of all the other lengths and angles on a triangle. In this example, we have two diameters. We subtract the smaller diameter from the bigger diameter and halve it and we've calculated the offset amount. Simple. In this example, we've been given a length and an angle. How do I calculate the offset amount? We use trigonometry. So 
tan equals opposite over adjacent. We want to calculate the opposite length. So tan 3.57 degrees equals x, which is the length that we're looking for, divided by 80. So therefore, x equals tan 3.57 times 80. Therefore, x equals 5 millimeters. So we offset the tailstock 5 millimeters. For those of you who need a bit of a refresher course on trigonometry, there's some resource material available on PMoodle. It is important to read diagrams carefully. If we have a look at that 80 millimeters, that's not the length of the taper. That's where the taper begins and ends. That makes it the adjacent side of the triangle. If you look at this drawing specification, the overall length of the taper is specified. And we can see here now it's 80.17 millimeters. In this example, we're still looking for the opposite side of our triangle, but this time we're going to use sine because sine equals opposite over hypotenuse because we have the hypotenuse, we have the angle. So all we need to now is find out what X is. So sine 3.57 equals opposite over hypotenuse, which is X divided by 80.17. We reshuffle the formula to make X the subject of the formula. So X equals sine 3.57 times 80.17. And lo and behold, our offset distance is five millimeters. How do we offset the tailstock accurately? There are graduations at the back of the tailstock, but how accurate are they? How small do the graduations go? I'm not going to use a steel rule because that's not very accurate either. I'd mount a dial indicator in the tool holder and offset the tailstock using a dial indicator. In this case, I would offset it five millimeters. That's assuming that my tailstock was in the parallel position. So obviously we have to get our tailstock parallel to the center line first before we do any offsetting because any error will be added to the taper. We looked at aligning the tailstock to the center line of the lathe in a previous unit. I can use my cross slide graduations to offset the tailstock. Place a bar or rod in the tool post, set my cross slide distance to five millimeters and wind the tailstock over until it touches the rod or the bar, putting a bit of paper or a very thin filler gauge in between the two so as not to damage the spindle on the tailstock. Special attachments for your tailstock can increase the taper capacity of your machine. Here we can see an example of a modified boring head from a milling machine placed in the tailstock of a lathe with a modified live center to increase the taper capacity of the machine. Measuring tapers. We don't always have the luxury of a drawing or a technical specification. We can derive angles, tapers and lengths from direct measurement and some simple trig calculations. We can use verniers, rules, micrometers, etc. Bearing blue is often used for checking mating parts, especially tapers. Here we can see a milling arbor being checked. They could be also checking the tapered bore. Section two, screw cutting on a lathe.
Here we can see a large hydraulic push rod being threaded on one end. This is being held between centers. In this configuration, even a long tapered thread is possible due to the fact that it's been held between centers and the tailstock can be offset. Not all center laves are the same. Some machines have additional features and accessories, but most laves can create threads, metric, inch, or sometimes even both. Machines will vary in capacity, horsepower, and range. For example, the pitches and threads per inch that they can support. Let's now have a look at the basic screw cutting controls that most laves will have. Make sure you check with your lathe's user manual for any details on your specific machine. Most lathes will have two shafts that can control the movement of the carriage. One is the feed shaft, this is for general turning and facing. The other shaft is a lead screw. This is responsible for creating screw threads. There are some machines that incorporate a lead screw and a feed shaft on one shaft. There's a lever which engages the half nut, which is connected to the lead screw. And we have a chasing dial for tracking the thread while we're cutting it. For screw cutting to be possible on a lathe, there needs to be a synchronous relationship between the spindle and the lead screw. The synchronous relationship is established through the use of change gears, a gearbox, and of course the lead screw. Most lathes will have a gearbox and spare change gears with instructions on how to manipulate the ratio of the synchronization of the spindle and lead screw. In the metric screw thread system, we are familiar with the term pitch. It is the distance between the peaks of the thread. It is also the distance a nut travels along a bolt in one full revolution. This is referred to as the lead. Hence the term lead screw. Let's look at an example of manually calculating a gear ratio for screw cutting. Our machine has a lead screw with a pitch of six millimeter, so the lead is six millimeters. Our desired lead or pitch is two millimeters because the thread we're machining is a M14 by two. So two to six equals one to three. So it'll take three rotations of the spindle for the lead screw to rotate once and travel six millimeters. So that means after one rotation of the spindle, the carriage will move along two millimeters. And that's our desired pitch. Here we can see the relationship of the synchronous motion of the spindle, the lead screw and the tool. Most lathes will have feed selection charts. The pictured machine is quite handy as it does metric and inch threads. The letters and numbers next to the feed values are gearbox lever positions. Some lathes have combinations of gearbox and change gears. Refer to your specific lathe manual for details. Before we start machining, we need to do some calculations. Thread depth calculations. We know the outside diameter is 14 millimeters. Let's say M14 by two. We know how to set our lathe gearbox for the correct pitch or TPI if it was a imperial thread. What about the thread depth? Well, one way is to look up the thread in the machinery's handbook or some tables, subtract the major diameter from the minor diameter and then halve it. Or we can use a factor in this case, by multiplying our pitch, which is two millimeters, by 0 0.61244, we can calculate our thread depth. In our case, our thread depth is 1.226 millimeters. 
Let's check my result on a thread lookup table. I'm 1.227 millimeters. I'm within one micron. That's good enough for me. There's thread depth information from the Machinery's Handbook and some useful tables that you can find by Googling. Pause the video now if you want to record the thread depth factors for Whitworth and Unified. Note that the Unified and Metric are the same as they're both 60 degree flank angles. Tools and tool setting. As with other turning operations, there are various tool types and grades. The most common for screw cutting are high speed steel tools and carbide insert tools. There are various grades available for both tooling systems to cater for different materials and conditions. High speed steel tools require grinding to the correct flank angle, for example, 60 or 55 degree. And clearance and rake angles need to be customised for the materials that we're cutting. As in the diagram, a screw cutting gauge is being used to set up and grind the correct angle on the tool. This is commonly done by a skilled tradesperson on an offhand grinder. A tool and cutter grinder can be used if there's one available. Carbide insert tools come already formed to the correct flank angle and for the material that we're going to be cutting. The tool needs to be exactly 90 degree tangent to the workpiece. Once again, the thread setting tool is being utilized. The top slide will be set at 30 degrees, which is half the flank angle and will be responsible for the depth of cut. Scratch the tool on the diameter of the workpiece so we can set our zero. The cross slide will be zeroed and will be responsible for retraction and return. The cross slide will always be at zero during all cutting operations. The top slide needs to be zeroed also as it is responsible for the depth of cuts and ultimate thread depth. Ensure that you've considered blind corners and run off or run out. In this example, there's a recess before the face enabling the tool to be retracted without damaging the face or the thread. A chamfer was also created at the end of the workpiece to allow for a lead in for the thread. The screw cutting lever engages the half nuts connecting the carriage to the lead screw. The tracking dial enables the operator to engage the screw cutting lever at the correct moment, ensuring the correct synchronization between cuts. According to my lathe manual, when cutting a two millimeter pitch thread, I can engage my screw cutting lever anywhere and I don't have to change any chasing gears. A handy tip though, if you engage the lead screw lever at the same spot every time, you don't have to worry about calculations or setting up. Obviously, this is for single start threads only. Multi start, you've got no choice. You have to set up the chasing dial. Let's take a cut using the engage disengage method. Set a slow spindle speed. This is a manual operation, so you want to be able to control what's going on. Start the spindle. We're going to do a light test cut. So set the top slide to about 0.1 millimeter test cut. Watch the tracking dial as it's turning. When a number lines up, engage the screw cut lever. Take note of the tracking number that you used. At the desired thread length, disengage the screw cut lever and retract the cross slide one full turn. Wind the carriage past the end of the workpiece and turn off the spindle. We're going to take a quick measurement before we continue cutting the thread. We'll turn the cross slide back to the zero position, preparing it for the next cut. Check the pitch 
and the length of the thread with a rule and or with a screw pitch gauge, making sure that we've got our machine settings correct. Restart the spindle and repeat the operation until you're at the final thread depth. Do light cuts for the first couple of passes just to get an idea uh, how deep you can go per pass. Once we've reached our thread depth, we can use the mating part, a nut, or we can directly measure the thread. Practice makes perfect. Practice on various threads and materials so as to familiarize yourself with the screw cutting operation. Another popular method for screw cutting is to leave the screw cutting lever engaged and throw the machine in reverse while retracting the cross slide at the same time. The thread depth is still set by the top slide. Not all laves can be reversed immediately. Check with your laves operation manual. The following video is an example of screw cutting, leaving the screw cutting lever engaged and reversing the spindle. This is sometimes referred to as the beginner's method. At the end of the desired thread, the operator stops the spindle and retracts the cross slide. By reversing the spindle, the carriage can be returned to the thread start point. If you reverse the spindle without retracting the tool, the thread will be damaged due to backlash in the lead screw.
As we can see in the video, the machinist used the mating part to check the thread. Sometimes we need to be a little bit more exact. Let's look at some of the ways that threads are properly measured. Measuring threads using a thread micrometer. Threaded parts, as we know, are identified by a number of measurement parameters. The pitch, or the threads per inch, the thread depth, the angle, major and minor diameters. There is one more dimension, and this is the pitch diameter, and it's considered to be the most important measurement of a thread. The pitch diameter is a line where the width of a thread ridge and the width of a thread groove are the same. This is how we measure threads. A thread micrometer makes this job easy. They usually come in sets with interchangeable anvils for different thread pitches. They come in metric or inch. You'll also need a thread table like the one in the machinery's handbook for the pitch diameter for your specific thread. According to my reference table, the pitch diameter for the 14 by 2 millimeter pitch thread is 12.701 millimeters. If you don't have a screw thread micrometer, another method of measuring thread depth is with the three wire method using standard wires and a standard micrometer. A measurement is taken from the outside of the wires. Once the measurement has been taken, a simple formula is applied and the result is checked against a thread lookup table. By using a wire constant table, I can take the pitch, work out what size wires to use, and it'll give me a constant, which I subtract from my measured diameter on the outside of the wires. I measured 14.350 around the outside of the wires. For a two millimeter pitch, I used a 45 thou wire, which converts to 1.143 millimeters. So the constant I subtract from my measured value is 1.6969. That works out to 12.653 millimeter pitch diameter. It's important to note that I used inch wires because that's what I have in my toolbox. Hence my inch wire size. If you have metric wires, use the metric wire lookup table. Ah, according to my table, I'm a bit undersized. I'm going to have to go to the machinery's handbook to see if I'm within tolerance. According to the Machinery's Handbook, I'm a 6G tolerance class. That means my minimum pitch diameter is 12.503. My maximum pitch diameter is 12.663. My measured pitch diameter is 12.653. I'm well inside my tolerance. If you don't have a thread micrometer or you don't have wires or tables, what you can do is you can use the mating part to check the fit as you're cutting the thread and you can be creative. We know the thread depth, so we can come up with some way of measuring the thread depth by bending a bit of metal or, or being uh, you know, creative with what you've got lying around. I need to upgrade my thread wires as they are bent and looking a bit old. I found these on eBay for about $60. The set comes with a conversion chart showing pitch, wire size, and constant. Metric and inch. Perfect. Section 3. Lathe attachments. Taper turning attachments can be purchased from the original equipment manufacturers or as an aftermarket accessory. Taper turning attachments for tailstocks can also be used to extend tailstocks offset amount. Tool post grinders can be bolted onto the carriage, turning the center lathe into a cylindrical 
an internal grinding machine. Facing and taper grinding can also be achieved on a Sennelay fitted with a tool post grinder. A vice or work holding device can be mounted on the top slide, turning the center lathe into a basic milling machine. The travel and capacity will be limited, but might provide some functionality when a milling machine is not available. Machines can be purchased as mill lathe combos. Bolt on milling heads can also be purchased for some lathes. Although limited in capacity, combos may provide a solution to a particular application. Tapping square to a surface can be a challenge at the best of times. We can use the tailstock to tap or align a tap or die. And of course, we can completely tap or thread the component in the lathe, depending on the situation. In the absence of a threading tool, I had to utilize a tap to create an external thread with a little bit of lateral thinking, I can get the job done. In this particular scenario, I will not be able to use the beginner's method of screw cutting because by disengaging the screw cut lever, I'm going to strip the thread. I will have to use a more advanced method of screw cutting. One of the methods is to simultaneously retract the cross slide and reverse the spindle assuming my machine is capable of instantly reversing. The other is to simultaneously retract the cross slide and disengage the half nut. This will require that you take note of your tracking dial position. Don't forget to do a test cut and check your gearbox and alignment settings before taking your first depth cut. Digital readouts make life easy. A lot of them come standard with built-in functions like cycles, teach and replay, multiple datums and memory. They are inexpensive and readily available, a must-have for any hobby or professional machinist. Pictured here is a three-axis digital readout fitted on a lathe. The x-axis display can be switched from the top slide to the compound slide. Perfect for screw cutting and other operations. All three axes can be displayed simultaneously, if required. 